discussing the news and making sense of a nation on the go. You're listening to The Long Form with Sunny Nayombia. This podcast is brought to you by The New Times. Hello, everyone. The news that the UN court in The Hague would not try the infamous genocide funder Felicia Kabuga for his crimes on the grounds of his old age, though sad, did not come as a shock to me. It felt quite par for the course where the issue of justice for Rwandan victims of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi was concerned. With this and other recent judicial travesties in mind, where do I think this all leaves us? I also want to examine the reasoning behind Malawi's move to revoke the citizenship of over 200 Rwandans following the arrest of Fulgens Kaishema in South Africa. Let me remind you all that the criminal was traveling around Southern Africa on a Malawian passport using the name Postani Chikuse for a few years. We'll then conclude the podcast with some positive news. On the sporting front, two football teams, both representing PSG Academy Rwanda, defeated teams from Brazil at the just-concluded 2023 PSG Club World Cup Championships. So, what did these victories prove? Now, if you want to react to this conversation, use the hashtag longformrw on Twitter and share your thoughts. But before we continue, do you know what you need to do today? You need to join the over 40,000 daily subscribers of the New Times e-paper to enjoy credible, in-depth reporting on Rwanda. Visit the website newtimes.co.rw to register for free. And now, back to the show. So, I'm joined once again by my producer, Precious Kirezi, to take a deep dive into today's topics. How, Precious, has this week been for you? Well, I've been seeing some very head-rattling news. Yeah. So, it's been a week of plot twists for me. So, what was the first plot twist? Well, to begin with, I'm very, very appalled by how Felicia Kabuga just gets away with everything. Mm. I don't understand why Randans are being evicted from a whole country. Mm -hmm. And just everything is going up in flames. I mean, that's just the nature of news, right? So, we will, we're getting a lot of bad news, I guess, this week. And I think the first piece of bad news probably is Felicia Kabuga not being tried. So is it true that he's getting off scot free? Huh. In a nutshell, yes and no. I want us to remember a few things about Kabuga. He is alleged to have funded a lot of the mechanisms that went around uh, purchasing the arms of war that were used during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. He was also uh, well known as being one of the shareholders, major shareholders, if not the most major shareholder of the genocidal radio RTLM, Radio Libre de Mille Collines. So you have this guy who was the money bags and his main building, the building that he's known for, um, known as Kwa Kabuga, which is now uh, the home of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, police in, in Nyaru Jenje, uh, was a infamous site of where there was a huge roadblock right in front of the building and um, thousands, if not tens of thousands pe of people were killed there. So when you talk to Rondans, his name is quite well known within that sphere of what he did in the genocide or what he did coming towards the genocide. He obviously was one of the most the richest men in Rwanda. He, he owned uh, trucking businesses. He owned real estate. He also owned a uh, tea plantation. So he was an extremely well-off man. Now, what he did was get his wealth and use it for evil. One of the most infamous stories that we have is that some of of the tools of genocide, in this case, uh, machetes, were purchased through or his company, or it was actually him actually uh, funding it. But there are stories, uh, allegations that the machetes that were used, that were imported from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from China, were purchased using his money. So a lot of Rwandans really looked at him as a reason why some of the uh, a lot of the killings happened, right? Whether through hate radio or even the weapons that he bought or the people that he paid for. Now, after the genocide, he flees, he 
uh, allegedly goes through Congo, then he ends up in Kenya, in Nairobi. They, they almost caught him, but there was a whole scandal there because uh, the allegation that was that he was being protected by the Kenyan government of the time of Dan Daniel Arab Moy. And there's even another story that a Kenyan wanted to report his presence to the Americans because the Americans at the time, he was among those, you know, the 10 most sought after criminals and there were the prizes if you could get him, like, if I'm not mistaken, about $10 million for him. So one of the Kenyans wanted to say, hey, I, I know where this man is. And the story is that someone tipped off Kabuga that this was going to happen. He fled, but not before killing off that Kenyan. Kenyan. Funny enough, he then travels to um, Switzerland. And now he's found in Switzerland again. And Rondons try to get him extradited for his crimes. Somehow he's chased out of Switzerland. Instead of being sent to Rwanda, he somehow ends up in, if I'm not mistaken, Cameroon. And from Cameroon, using those networks, because these guys, you know, remember, these are guys who had been close to power for many, many years. He, they had networks all over Africa. And when you have money, you can make things happen. So somehow he just disappears off the face of the earth. There are stories that, you know, he's been cited here, there's been cited there. He was almost like, uh, a ninja like he appeared and then he disappeared no one really knew where he was until 2020 where all of a sudden during the coronavirus the world shuts down no one's moving and then they were still looking for him if i'm not mistaken the french police start trying to monitor a few things they tried to start monitoring his children they lead the french police to a little apartment in paris and lo behold there he is living in the heart of the french capital one of the 10 most wanted criminals of the last 20 years, uh, last 30 years, right? So he's arrested. I was really surprised that he was arrested having been found in, in France because remember that we've not traditionally had very good... Um, Relations with France? No. And, and France for the longest time has been known for having these people being untouched, whether it is Agatha Kanziga, who is the uh, wife of uh, the late President Juvenal Habyarimana, whether it is the um, Father Munye Shaka, who was infamous for being the priest who killed people. It's tough, right? And when is last Munye Shaka? He was the priest from uh, St. Fami Church. So there's a famous picture of him, you know, with a um, bulletproof vest. He had a gun on his um, hip and he was very, very close to power as well. He has been in France for God knows how many years. And the government, uh, survivor group, tried to get the French government to do something about this killer priest, as we call him. They did nothing. Even the Catholic Church, no one did anything, right? Only till this year where he was found to have impregnated a, a woman and had children with her, was he then said, we don't want you in the Catholic Church anymore. It's very surprising how playing a part in the genocide has him going unscathed. But when he engages in sexual relations, suddenly ethics kick in. So that was my thinking. So imagine my surprise when Kabuga, the financier of genocide, was found in Paris. That made me think something has fundamentally changed here. But on one side, while thinking that, I was also very skeptical of the fact that we would actually get justice. As soon as I realized that he was never going to be extradited to Rwanda and there was this special court that was going to try him, I realized, okay, this is probably going to take a ton of money. Uh, it will take a really, really long time. So there's not going to be a speed in execution. And this trial might be so long that he might actually just die in prison, right? While the trial is going on. Because remember, he's 88 now. He was arrested at 85. It seems like he was diabetic. And there was he was just an older man. So let's not like try to make him a sympathetic character. He was just older. Older without having ever faced justice. Let's just put that to the side. I was on one side very hopeful. I was happy that this guy would not just live and die and never be asked to account for some of his actions. But on the other side, I was not confident that would actually ever hear a, a guilty verdict. So imagine my quote unquote shock. I started hearing rumblings that, you know, he's old. Like, is it fair? He's an old man. Does he even know what's going on? And lo and behold, because that's the first thing any kind of criminal case, someone has to have the ability to understand what's going on around him. So the first thing that they, they said was like, oh, but this old man. He doesn't really understand what's going on. So the court said, let him get examined by professionals, some independent professionals to see if he can be fit for trial. What was found out was that he is senile.
This is what they actually said. They said that they noted his cognitive and physical functions have progressively and significantly deteriorated since the pretrial stage due to, quote unquote, severe dementia. Pretty much what they're saying is he cannot follow what's going on. I think as long as the person knew what they were doing when they were doing it, they still have to account for their actions. That's that's a fair assessment. That's a fair assessment. But very often, that's why they in, in law, sometimes you can say, you know, someone cannot go on trial because they are crazy. They are insane. Because for a trial to work, there, there has to be an understanding of what's going on. You, just at the basic level, there has to be their brain function has to. I'm not saying that this is not the case here. But could we also say that if they had acted faster, if the trial had not been this slow? Because remember, they arrested him in 2020. These are three years that he could have, Gachacha was much faster. If we could have had him, if they could have extradited him here, and he could have gone to our courts, it wouldn't have taken more than a couple of months to find out whether or not he was guilty. Obviously not. That's not what happened. And now, it's funny enough, like his lawyers then said, because they found that he doesn't have the mental capacity, they should let him go. He's an old man. Let him go. What I'm happy is that the court did not also allow that. What the court has done is try to create, proceed with what they call an alternative finding procedure. So an alternative finding procedure is almost like a trial without the punishment. That's, that's crazy, right? So literally what's going to happen is that the prosecution will present its evidence and the defense will present its uh, counter argument and the judges will find out whether or not this is true or false but they're not going to find him guilty or innocent. So they're going to actually have a trial. We can call it a trial of the facts. The, the questions will be, did he fund RTLM? Yes or no? Did RTLM, could you prove that he was the funder? Could you prove that he paid for uh, weapons that were used in killing? Who, what did he know? When did he know it? Those kind of questions, those are the things that will be part of the case. But let's call it a court case. Uh, that's what's going to happen. But there's going to be no guilty or innocent plea. And he will not be in court because the judge is pretty much saying there's no reason to, for you to be here. No one's, no one's talking to you. This doesn't really affect you. This is just about the facts now. It's a bad thing because there's no punishment, but maybe it's better than just letting everything go because then we shall actually know the truth of his role. The idea of, okay, there will be no punishment for this man, but it will no longer be allegations. It will be Kabuga actually did this. He did this, he did this, he did this, and this is what it caused. On one side, I'm happy because it could have gone worse. They could have literally said, this man is too old. He needs to be released. Is that better than a dress rehearsal? Because that's what we're getting. Right? So if we remove the punishment, but then maybe we think about the lessons of history, especially at this time where we're seeing more genocide denial, where people are saying, did these things really happen? Uh, was RTLM actually this, this monster? Or Because there's that, that's what we're seeing uh, as time goes away, uh, as time moves on from uh, 1994. There's fewer and fewer people who actually ever listen to the broadcasts. There are fewer and fewer people who can actually remember all these characters. Because that's, that's the way genocide denial works. It wants us to forget the facts and then bring in counterfacts. Maybe by this trial, through the tra transcripts of the trial and the rulings, we can actually know what this man actually did in financing the genocide. That's one of the good things. But truthfully, my cynical side says I could have seen this coming. It's pretty much par for the course in terms of what I've seen from Europe. Europeans seem to be way too comfortable with harboring genocide perpetrators, mm. don't they? Why? That's literally true. If we look at, there's another court case, right? Now it's no longer in an international court, but now it's in the Dutch Supreme Court. Literally a problem. I don't want to, to smile about this, but I, 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 I smile in frustration. So the Dutch Supreme Court on Tuesday, so this, this would be last Tuesday, ruled that Pierre Claver Carangua could not be extradited to Rwanda on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity because he could not be guaranteed a fair trial. Let's also remember that it's not the first time for someone to be extradited by 
by a Dutch court. Funny enough, on one side, they have actually, the, the Dutch system has extradited uh, Rwandans back to Rwanda. You have Jean-Baptiste Mujimba and Jean-Claude Ramuremye. And these are some of the two people that have been sent back. But because he's quote unquote a politician now, you know, he cannot be guaranteed a, a fair trial. Let's also remember where he's a politician for. He's a commissioner of the FDU in Hing. So this is also a political party that is pushing for denialism, genocide ideology, and they're also part of the P5 rebel group. Would you call him a politician? Yeah, maybe a politician of hate, maybe a politician of murder, maybe a politician of uh, terrorism, but... It's not that deep. No, literally, it's, it's actually quite sad. They're not saying that he's probably not guilty because he actually probably is at uh, the time of the genocide. He was a major in the genocidal army, the, the forces armée Juandes of that time. And he was noteworthy for being one of the key masterminds of the killing of 20,000 Tutsis in former Jitarama in a place called Mujina. So that is who he is. That He was uh, a soldier. He was a leader in the community. And this is 20,000 people. He might have had a direct relationship to the murder of 20,000 people. But to hell with all that. To hell with all that. They're looking at him and saying, okay, you're a politician. We're worried about your political freedoms. That is just the nature of the beast. Then you go to the UK as well. So it's not just a mainland Europe thing. The UK, them, they're even worse at least the dutch have sent some people back at least the french have you know arrested some like at least the french won't extradite people but they will put them through trial and they've actually found a few guilty the british nothing so we actually have people in the uk untouchable they're not being tried the uk government has refused to try them and have refused to send them back and so much so that actually our uh, high commissioner to the uk was in the uk parliament asking saying guys Please do something. You cannot have seven major genocidaires just walking around, having a great time. Some of them even probably on government assistance over there. When you ask me about them being being quite comfortable, yes, uh, it seems that they are. And they would never do this if they were, I don't want to bring in equivalents, but imagine if we were not black Africans and these were Jewish, some of the Nazis who were part of the Holocaust. The Europeans don't play about these things, but somehow... Our genocidaires, people who've participated in the murder of 100,000 plus people, uh, their comfort and their freedoms uh, mean more to those Europeans than uh, justice. justice. No, 100%. It just sucks because it makes me realize again and again that this international order of justice and, and fairness and uh, these international systems are just a bunch of uh, hogwash, really. It's about might is right and Unfortunately, we just don't have the might right now, but maybe one day when we... Uh, Stop being leftists, we can <laughs> get justice. It's just an unfortunate state of affairs, really. Before we continue this very interesting conversation, are you looking for a job or is there a tender you want to bid for? On the New Times Job Mart, you will find hundreds of jobs and tender listings. Visit the Job Mart today by going to its website, jobs.newtimes.co.rw If you want to post a job opportunity, call 7 85 and ask about the great rates. And now back to the show. Let's move away from Europe and head to Southern Africa, Malawi to be exact. The Malawian government recently revoked the citizenship of 230 Rwandan nationals alongside other individuals due to concerns over suspicious acquisition of naturalization papers. Why this and why now? What do you think? If we look back to the earlier topic, which was about genocide perpetrators and these powers not using their abilities to extradite their judicial systems or their governance systems to extradite or to try these people. I think with the Malawians, I think it's another thing, right? Remember where we were talking about like the fact that maybe Rwandans are not able to get justice because we are weak? I think that in this case, it might be because of two main reasons about why 
I think that they've been embarrassed because remember that uh, we said that Fuljans Kaishama, who is probably one, if not the last major genocide uh, fugitive. Remember, he was found in South Africa um, earlier this last month. Um, so he was found in South Africa. And they actually found that among the papers that he used were uh, forged the Malawian papers. He was actually literally called Postiani Chikuse. And this is Fuljans Kaishama, right? So... These were official documents that were given to uh, him by the ministry of, I think it's their inter the equivalent of the internal security. So he had these papers. And then he was able to move around and he went to Swaziland and then he ended up in Southern Africa, in South Africa. Him being found by one, the UN system, and then when they went through all his documents, they realized that he actually had Malawian papers. The Malayan government was quite embarrassed about it. There was that level of embarrassment. And because they got quite embarrassed about it, they said, hey, let us find out what this really looks like. You know, because they, they really looked bad. They, it, was, it was not a, a great look for the, their entire government. Whether it's from the president to the ministers, it, it, it just wasn't a good look that this fugitive of justice was using your documents to go around. So there was that sense of shame. And then there was obviously also the idea of what is Rwanda and its standing in Southern Africa. For the longest time, we were an inconsequential nation that literally could not punch above its weight. And when I see the way Rwanda is moving its partnerships in the region, whether it's in Zimbabwe, whether it's in uh, Botswana and Mozambique, I'm seeing that issues of Rwanda are starting to be taken seriously by our African partners. But it's also because we're starting to become a serious country, a country of note, a country that you have to deal with. And so I feel like there's the shame of it being found that, you know, this criminal was using their, their, their documents, but then also saying, wow, we work closely with Rwanda. We want to continue working with Rwanda. We might want to also correct all these mistakes because if you think about it, obviously not all the 200 plus are genocidaires. Maybe not. Maybe they might even be kids. But they're now saying we don't want to be a part of these kind of errors because Rwanda is also a serious partner. And so I, I look at it in two ways. One, it's the shame. But the, on the other side is the fact that Rwanda is more, is more consequential. Years ago, that was never a problem because these guys have been in Malawi. We know that there are Rwandans who uh, probably got fake documents all over Southern Africa. But I do think that with Rwanda starting to not push its weight around, but rather take its rightful place in the community of nations, more nations don't want to be on not our bad side, but do not want to cause uncomfortable feelings between themselves and Kigali. Sounds like they want to stay neutral and they're just like wiping their hands off of Rwandans. Pretty much so. They're saying, hey, listen, we don't want to have problems with your state. So let us wash our hands of all these people. And it's good politics for them. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't because they had been shamed. I wish it was something that was organic Genuine. rather than politics. But on the other side, you, you have to ask yourself, okay, what kind of states would have allowed this to happen? Maybe we're asking too much of them. Maybe they are so dysfunctional, they're so corrupt that that's what happens. But on the other side, you can't call them corrupt and then they are able to then identify, right? They were able to say, oh, no, 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 we made a mistake. These are the Rwandans. And then they also roped in some maybe 160 other Africans and, and said, ah, these are the ones who are... Um, Problematic. Yes. So that's Malawi. I found it very interesting simply because I felt that there was also a diplomatic thing about it. It wasn't just, oh, we're shamed by the UN because I don't know if they, they have that sense of shame. They should have had that sense of shame when they were giving him travel documents, but they had no sense of shame then. So now it's about international prestige, but even continental prestige. Sometimes consciences grow in their consequences. A hundred percent. And the truth of the matter is you have RDF working very, very closely with uh, uh, Sadak in uh, Mozambique and their Malawian troops there. Very soon, we might be seeing uh, Malawian troops in um, Eastern DRC as part of uh, another uh, international force there alongside the East African uh, uh, forces. 
there were different diplomatic moves that had to be made. And I think in this case, the Rwandans who had finangled their way into Malayan citizenship, they unfortunately are the victims of uh, the new reality on the ground. Rwanda didn't have all bad news this week. On a positive note, PSG Academy was crowned 2023 World Cup champions after beating Brazil in, in the finals in both the under-11 and under-13 categories to take home trophies that were up for contest in the French capital of Paris. Should Rwandan fans be excited about what happened on Monday or is it another false stone? It could go both ways. Right. So obviously, as a, a fan of young people, I'm excited that that team are represented themselves and their families and their communities very, very well. Right. So we start from that individual level because it's it's hard. Right. So these kids were training very, very, very uh, hard, diligently. Their coaching staff uh, worked very hard with these kids. Their families supported them. And through their hard work, they were able to be quote-unquote uh, world champs. At least somebody from Randa won something in sports. So on that side, I'm happy uh, with that. Now, when we think about our sports, we also have to talk about it in, in, in terms of a systemic level. These kids have done well, but it's not the first time that uh, we see kids doing well. Even last year, they won this very, very same competition. And a few years back, our under-16s performed very, very well at the Youth World Cup. So they, they among the teams that beat us are people who now play for the English uh, national team, the Three Lions. So that was then. That was, that was close to a decade ago, if not more. But from the kids that were doing so well then, we didn't see it translate to the national team. Youth is only as good as the continued growth. They've done well at, at the under-11 stage. They've done well at the under-13 stage. Now there's going to be the under-15. There's going to be the under-17s. There's going to be the under-19s. There's going to be the under-21s and then the national uh, level. So right now, they're being coached and being supported by, you know, the Visit Rwanda PSG partnership. You're having uh, coaches being trained by PSG. That is just a small academy, though. The question that we should ask ourselves is, is it enough for our kids in these academies to do well? Do we want more for them? I'm I'm happy to see us win because it tells me that we're not inherently bad at football. Our children are not inherently untalented. They did not inherit that from you old guys. But even us older guys did not, we're not inherently bad at football. But what, what do we see these kids getting, right? They're getting uh, proper equipment, proper, probably proper nutrition. They're getting uh, good coaching. They're understanding systems. They're being taken care of. So they are getting exactly what kids in Brazil are getting who play for the, their, their PSG academy. They're being taught the same methodology. When you give Rondans the exact same, I think that's, uh, that should be the lesson, right? That if you give Rondans the exact same help, assistance, systems, they will perform. We are not inherently bad at things. I, sometimes it seems that poverty pushes us back to all these things. There's not something fundamentally wrong with us, right? When you think about uh, the NBA, their very, very, very best players uh, this year, the MVP of this year came, comes from Cameroon, uh, Joel Embiid. Uh, some of the best players historically in the NBA have come from Nigeria, have come from... Uh, South Sudan. So there's nothing inherently wrong with the African player. It's just these opportunities. Oh, can they get good coaching? Oh, can they get good pitches? Because these kids, guess where they're playing? They play in at the Huye Stadium, right? So they're getting, they're not playing in the dirt. They are playing on a pitch that is international level. They're playing with balls that are not uh, the plastic balls are made from trash. They're not playing with the balls made from dried banana fronds. They're playing with proper FIFA balls. They're, they're not being taught football by the village superstar. They're being taught by proper coaching and coaches, right? So that is one of the lessons that I'm seeing that, okay, when, when our kids are giving every, uh, given everything, 
right? All the things that they need to pro, to, to, to compete, they can compete. There's nothing inherently wrong with us. Now, the challenge that I would like to uh, give to our sporting community is when these talented kids come out of the PSG Academy, what next? Are you going to keep the same energy for the under 15s? Or how about this? Are the coaches who are being taught the PSG methodology and, and, and being allowed to pick these kids and spend real time with them, are they doing that in uh, Jikongoro? I mean, sorry, Nyamagabe. Are they doing that in Rubavu? Are there similar things happening in Kigali? Are there similar things happening in Chirehe? We've proved that we can find talent in Huye because these kids study there. They, they, they study in the schools there. They, they live with their families, so they're from that community. But we've proved that, that there's talent. We just have to be able to identify it, train it, equip it, make sure that the kids are not stunted by providing them proper nutrition, and the sky's the limit. So, It didn't sound like you're objectifying them at all. No, but that's the thing with athletes, right? So you're only as good as your nutrition. One of the things, one of the challenges that we know as a country is that we have challenges with nutrition, especially with children. We have issues with stunting. That's why, you know, government is trying to make sure that kids are being fed in school. They're, they're getting milk. Now there's even ideas of giving them pork, uh, which is a very, very high protein meal. So all of this to allow kids to live and reach their topmost uh, potential. And what uh, the PSG uh, Rwanda under 11s and under 13s have showed is that if we give our kids everything, our kids will give us everything, including uh, football glory. That is the end of today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining me this week, uh, Precious. Thank you for having me today. That's that. Until next week, folks. Bye-bye. Before we leave, would you like to partner with The Long Form? Send an email to sales at newtimesronda.com and ask for our rates. If you enjoy this show, subscribe to The Long Form with Sunny Nyombia on your favorite podcast service. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music, as well as the New Times website. Until next week, goodbye.